the Methodist Church is splitting, the Episcopal Church is deciding to split too, over biblical doctrine and God's words and standards. Some churches are basically just thrown out what the Bible says about certain issues, and you won't ever hear them address them probably for several reasons. And one of the reasons is because if they do, they'll lose people. And if they lose people, they're also going to lose money because that goes along with people, revenue. And the third reason would be they don't believe that the Word of God written 6,000 years ago or even the Word that was written 2,000 years ago applies to us today. But we know that God doesn't change and God's Word doesn't change either. Malachi says this, I am the Lord, I change not. In Hebrews it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Psalms 119 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. In other words, God doesn't change. There's seeker-friendly churches who don't want to offend anyone, and they're all over the place. They don't want to offend anybody with the word of God. True. I mean, you can go there, you can get your coffee, you can sing a couple songs, you can uh, get a sermonette that designed not to offend you or ruffle your feathers in any way that won't really challenge you and design to make you feel good about yourself, whether yourself is living in sin or not. Uh, because if you, if you are living in sin, it should bother you. If there's sin in your life, whatever it is, it should bother you because you have a Holy Spirit that kind of rejects that in life. It kind of leads you in other places. But um, most believers don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to share their faith because it's under attack. We are um, persecuted when we openly say what God has to say about a subject. So most of the time we say nothing. We do nothing because the world we live in just gets darker and darker. And you might think that it's not going to affect you, but it does. It affects you in one way or other. The biggest way it affects you is that when you say nothing and when you do nothing, it brings compromise into your life. But you, how can we tell if we're compromising? One of the ways is, first, are we sharing our faith like we once did? Remember when you were a new Christian, you were excited, so excited about Jesus, you had a, the fire of the Holy Spirit in you, most of us did, and we shared it with everybody and anybody who would listen. Are we still doing that today? Are we sharing our faith today? And second reason, are we living our faith out? Or has worldly thinking crept in by doing and watching and reading and fellowshipping with things that one time you wouldn't do because of Jesus? Do you remember when you wouldn't do certain things because you weren't worried about offending anybody else? but you were worrying about offending Jesus. How would Jesus feel about this? The book of Ephesians tells us that when we do that, we're following the course of this world. And the book of Revelation says, if we're not hot for the Lord, we're either cold or lukewarm. Now go with me in your Bibles today to Acts chapter 17. And we're going to look at Paul's first taste of PCness in the culture of his day. And I realize in almost 18 years, I have not taught um, out of this Acts chapter 17 that I know of. So I'm going to do it today. Acts 17, we're going to start at verse 22. We're going to start in verse 22. Let me know when you're there. Okay, good. It says, then Paul stood up before the meeting of the Areopagus council and said, Men of Athens, everything I see here tells me you're very religious. And I was going through your city and I saw the things that you worship. And I found an altar that had these words written on it, to the unknown God. You worship a God that you don't even know. 
This is the God I want to tell you about. He is the God who made the whole world and everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built with human hands, but he is the one that gives people life, breath, and everything else they need. He does not need any help from them. He has everything he needs. God began by making one man, and from him he made all the different people who live everywhere in the world. He decided exactly when and where they would live. God wanted people to look for him, and perhaps in searching all around for him, they would find him. But he's not far from any of us. It is through him that we're able to live and to do what we do and to be who we are. As your own poet said, we all come from him. That's right, we all come from God. So you must not think that he's like some other people imagine or make up. He's not made of gold or silver or stone. In the past, people did not understand God, and he overlooked this. But now he's telling everyone in the world to change and turn to him. He has decided on a day that when he will judge all people in the world in a way that is fair. To do this, he will use a man he chose long ago. And he has proved to everyone that this man can do it. He proved it by raising him from the dead. And when people heard about Jesus being raised from death, some of them mocked and laughed. But others said, we'll hear more about this from you later. Then Paul left the council meeting, but some of the people joined with Paul and became believers. Now here's Paul just going to a place just like a place that we live. Anything goes in a place where we live. As far as sin goes, people did what was right in their own eyes. People had the wrong idea who God was. They're worshiping idols. In the Romans time, sexual sin was the norm. Uh, and he's getting laughed at and mocked at by some, but other people believed what he had to say. In other words, he's living in a world just like the world we live in today. We have to deal with the same thing. And he makes it very clear by saying, and this is only one judge, and we will all stand before him one day. Can you bring that first slide up, right? <laughs> so the first point I want to make is that we're not the world's judges. God's the ultimate judge, and when we say, you are this or you are that, we make ourselves a judge. But the Bible clearly says in James chapter 4, verse 12, there's only one true lawgiver and judge, the one who has the power to save and destroy. So who do you think you are to judge your neighbor? We don't judge people, but we're called to judge the difference between right and wrong. And the Bible is our script on what is right and wrong. The first church that um, Tammy went to, and I went to once in a while, um, the pastor was an awesome man of God. And um, as a matter of fact, in 1974, about six months before I got shot, he came to the door of where I was, knocked on the door, and um, asked me a question. I answered the door, and he asked a question. He said, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would go? And I said, no, I don't. I said, I hope I would go to heaven. He said, would you like to know for sure where you would go? And I said, sure. So he led me to the Lord. He didn't have... <laughs> any other purpose or plan. He wasn't trying to add me to his church. He wasn't trying to get another notch in his belt. He had a burden even to go door to door to tell people about Jesus. I mean, I realized that was then. People don't do that anymore. Right. But um, they could, but they usually don't because it's a different time we live in. But he led me to the Lord. Six months later, I got shot and I died but and came back. But the thing is, I would have went to heaven because of what he did. He cared enough to do that. Like I said, he was an awesome man of God, but a lot of the other people, not everybody, but a lot of the other people that went to his church weren't. They were judging. They were judging big time. I remember Tammy um, had a friend that, she, I guess she was selling cosmetics, and she 
led this friend to the Lord and then took her that Sunday, took her to church with her to hear the gospel. She had just got saved and, and she took her to church with her and the lady happened to be a black lady. And at the end of the service, when you're walking out the door, they said, honey, there's a church for your kind down the street. And from uh, 10,000 feet, I, I saw this. And the next thing that when she first started going to the church, um, we were young and we didn't have a lot of money. And at the time, all she had was pants. She didn't have really any dresses to wear. So when she went to church, she was given a track saying why women should not dress as men and why women shouldn't wear pants to church. And uh, she was so much in love with Jesus and she didn't want to offend anybody. And so she wept and cried to the Lord and the Lord provided some dresses for her, a lot of dresses and yes. stuff like that. Somebody made sure she had. So she, her motive of her heart was not to get mad at these hypocritical, critical <laughs> Pharisees. But, uh, but she just didn't want to make anybody mad. She just wanted to do what's right. She was a young, new Christian. She was learning what's right. The thing is, with Pharisees, they never change anybody. Only the Spirit of God can change people. As a matter of fact, if they would have known their Bible, they would have known that nobody wore pants in Jesus' day. All the men wore tunics. They wore dresses. Okay? So it was, they had it completely backwards. When on occasion, when I went with her to this church, and now I know you're going to have to use your Holy Ghost imagination on this one. I would go in, and they wouldn't, I, they wouldn't be all that welcoming to me. Even though the pastor of that church is the one that brought me to the Lord, I was still, you know, me without God, basically. And I went in there, and I had kind of long hair. It wasn't even that long. You know, it was like, it was probably a lot shorter than it was. But, um... I went in there and instead of saying, welcome, glad you're here, they would tell me to get a haircut. And the thing is, I, like I said, you got to use your imagination. The thing is, if they just would have loved me and welcomed me, it would have been a couple more years, they wouldn't have had that problem. or Because I didn't have any hair. But what I'm trying to tell you is they were very judgmental. And because they were so judgmental, and I knew it, I didn't want to go to that church with a bunch of judgmental so-called Christians acting like Pharisees, like they were better than everybody else. That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to judge the people that come in. And I know I'm talking to a group that doesn't. I'm talking to a group where I know you welcome everybody that comes into this place. Regardless of creed or color or whatever it is, you welcome everybody and everybody's important in your eyes. But I'm saying, God didn't call us to judge people. Amen. However, he did cause us to judge between right and wrong and take a biblical stand Amen. and have a biblical standard. And a lot of people have let things like that slip from them. Can you bring up the next scripture, Graham? It says, stay away from all foolish arguments of the immature, for these disputes will only generate conflict. For a true servant of our Lord Jesus will not be argumentative but gentle towards all, and I would underline this in your Bible, and skilled in helping others see the truth. Having great patience towards the immature. Let me take a break right there before I read the rest of it. At one time, you know, I was, I've been pastoring for 18 years, and I've been in the ministry for a lot longer, but one time when the church was in its infant stage, we had people in, and a lot of them were new believers. And uh, how many people know you don't sit there and correct everything a new believer does? What you That's do is right. you love them, you get them rooted and grounded, you get them to sit underneath the Word of God, and you let God do the growing. You teach them the difference between what they should do and what they shouldn't do. You teach them. And I would have people come to me, older Christians come to me all the time and say, can't you make so-and-so do this? Yep. Can't you make them do this? And they would come to me and I would look at them and say, I can't make anybody do anything. But what I can do 
is I can have patience with them and their immaturity and I can skillfully help them see the truth. And when they do, it's the truth that sets them free. The Bible is the truth that sets them free. The word of God is what helps them. My reproof, my rebuke, my correction, what are they going to think of me? What do most people think? What do you think when you're corrected? This is what you think. Let me tell you, because I know everybody in here. Who are they to think they can correct me? It doesn't matter who you are. That's everyone's first thought. They all look at themselves first before they try to correct me. So skillfully help others see the truth. Having great patience towards the immature. Then with meekness, you'll be able to carefully enlighten those who argue with you so they can see God's gracious gift of repentance and be brought to the truth. Holy Ghost can do a lot more in one second than you can do in two hours. This will cause them to discover God for themselves and escape from the stare of Satan who caught them in his trap so that they would carry out his purposes. That's a powerful scripture, isn't it? So, question for you. How skilled are you in leading and helping people to see the truth? Do we draw them or do we push them away? Let me tell you that I am still a black and white person. I've, I've never seen gray. Right has always been right. Wrong has always been wrong. But you, with a new believer or somebody that's in sin, you have to see a little bit of gray. You have to be willing to walk with them through their stuff. You have to. Walk with them through and skillfully show them the way. If you try to rebuke them, it'll just push them away. When I was a new believer, because I'm a word person, because I love the word of God, and um, I saw, I didn't see black and white, just red. I saw black and white, usually. And you could say I was a lot more probably law back then. So people would come to me, and they would say, I don't know why this keeps on happening in my life. <coughs> so that was always an invitation to tell them. Yep. Hello? And, and guess what? They were, they were just making a statement. They weren't asking a question. <laughs> but I was sure quick to give them an answer. You all have a financial problem after financial problem after financial problem. Well, you don't tithe. How can God bless you? How can God, I mean, I mean, his word says, you know the word. Have you ever heard that before? Oh, yeah, I've heard it. Well, you ain't doing it. And then I would walk away, black and white. Did I help that person? As far as I know, I didn't help them. When they would ask me, they were, I mean, Tammy and I, right away, we, when we were serving God together, right away we would give, we'd give marriage counseling. And we were still working desperately on our own marriage, but we would still help other people when they would have it. So we would get onto a place where we needed to give marriage counseling, and I would just say, they would say, I don't understand why this, and I'd say, brother, you don't love your wife. What do you mean I don't love my wife? I said, open up to Ephesians 5. Read that. Are you doing that? No? I'd walk away. Was I helping that person? Or was I judging that person? I, I, I didn't know. I thought maybe that because I was so black and white. Now, I've had all... Since I've been a pastor, I've walked into a different grace. I've sat with some people over and over and over and over again and helped them. And I'm willing to. And walk with them through some of the hardest times in their life. Instructing, the Bible says, instructing them that oppose themselves. I get them to discover for themselves. Isn't that something? When you discover it for yourselves. I mean, I mean, Tammy could tell me a million things, right? But when I discover it for it myself, I own it, right? When you lead somebody so they can discover for themselves, they take ownership. And God can do more in that time than you could do if you gave hours. 
And that's the truth. So how do we take a biblical stand about things? I said we, we need to be able to take a biblical stand. We need to have a standard. And we need to judge between right and wrong first for ourselves and for other people. How many people know that Jesus is probably the best example? So let's turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And when you're there, let me know. There. Okay. Slow down, I ain't glad. This is 8. John chapter 8. Please refrain, that's recorded. Jesus walked up the Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts again. Soon, all the people gathered around him to listen to his words. So he sat down and taught them. In the middle of his teaching, I like that, right in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. Then they said to Jesus, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us, what do you say we should do with her? And they were only testing Jesus because they hoped to trap him with his words and actions of him breaking the law of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer him. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting that they, he answer the question. So Jesus stood up and looked at them and said, let the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. And then he bent over and wrote some more words in the dust. Upon hearing that, the accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, with a convicted conscience, until finally Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there in front of him. So he stood back up and said to her, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. Jesus said, then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go and from now on be free from a life of sin. What most self-righteous Christians would have done is throw a stone at her, with their, at least with their words and their judgment. But that's not what Jesus did, is it? Can we learn things from the ministry of Jesus? Yes. Who are we supposed to represent as Christians on the earth? We're supposed to be like him, aren't we? Yeah. And we have the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to help us. Now, in this story, I like to talk about what's not obvious. Here's the people being rude. Jesus is teaching, has a crowd. And I mean, you're going to be captivated at Jesus' teachings, right? Most people are. They stay with him for three days, right? Yeah. They listen to him teach. So here is, in the religious people of that day, the Pharisees and the scribes, they break through, dragging a woman who got caught in the very act of adultery. That means they must have broke in and caught her having sex. And I'm sure they didn't say, hurry up and get dressed. I'm sure she grabbed whatever was there as they drug her out of the house. I always think, Tammy reminded me of this. The first time I ever read this story, she said, Think about it. Where was the man? He was committing adultery too, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Where was the man? Why is there a double standard? Yep. Where's the man that was committing adultery? Shouldn't he have been stoned too? And I often, and another thing I often wondered about is we see Jesus bending down and writing something in the, in the dirt and saying the dust. <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to see what he was? I think I know. I think he was saying, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Because he showed his mercy. But the thing that gets me the most is, in this story is, that he looked at the woman, he said, woman, look around. When he told them, who has never had a thought of sin or a lustful thought? 
and he has a different, God has a different standard than we do. We think just if we do something, commit the act. But Jesus said, if a man even looks at a woman and lusts in his heart, he's committed adultery already. And Jesus, if this is before he ever said that, but he's thinking to himself, he's thinking, what man hasn't done that? So who are you to condemn? Another thing, God said, I didn't, John 3, 16, everybody knows, right? John 3, 17, Jesus said, I didn't, that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. But the world through him might be saved. That needs to be our focus. Take people out of darkness and into light. People in adultery don't need us to point out their wrongs. You know when you're in the wrong. I have never talked to one person who was living in adultery, and I've talked to a lot, who didn't know that they were doing something wrong. I've never talked to anybody in any sexual sin or any kind of big sin or any kind of bondage. I didn't ever talk to anybody that didn't know that they were in bondage. You don't talk to a heroin addict and they, don't, they deny it. You don't talk to an alcoholic and they deny it. They know they're in bondage. We have the word that sets the captive free inside of us. We give them the word, let the Holy Spirit do the work. Let God draw them. Because we're supposed to be like him. We're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to do what Jesus did. What would Jesus do? We wore the bracelets and we have the bumper stickers, but we don't do it. I got a question for you, and I'll use you, Janine, since you're right there. No, it's not. It's me. Hey. Good. No, this is not you or me. This is just a reflection of you and me. It's just a mirror. It reflects whatever it looks at. Does it? I mean, this is you. I don't say, let's go over to Janine's house, and I go over there, and it's a mirror. Over this, right? We don't do that. It's just a reflection. So when people look at us, what do they see? Do they see you? Or do you reflect Jesus to them? Because you can. You can. You are the only Bible some people will ever read. Your life is the only witness that and they'll ever hear about. They should be able to tell we're a Christian without wearing a t-shirt. Or without being a Bible thumper. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify God who is in heaven. You're supposed to have a light that shines. You're supposed to have uh, a light of your life. You're supposed to the Holy Spirit through you. You don't have to, all you have to do is live and they'll know. You be you and God. You reflect Jesus and they'll know. There's been people that have been under conviction because I just walked in the room we know that. I never condemned them. I never said one thing to them. But they're under conviction because the God in me is brighter than the darkness in them. Can you turn down the lights one time, please, for me, Tammy? Turn them over there. Now, it's, it's, it's dark in here. Now, turn them up. All the way up. What happened to the darkness? It's gone. Why? Because the light showed up. But here's what I see happening. You're a demo preacher, right? Probably when you got something like that. We see these are two different kind of bulbs. One of them is a more watts than the other one. One of them's can think, you know what? If this light showed up, would it chase darkness away? No, it wouldn't. It only chases darkness away when it has the power of hope to it. The fact that it's glass and has the potential and capability to do it does not mean anything unless it's put to the power. And that's one of the things I want to tell you today. Unless you're connected to the power of God, you're not going to be a light for anybody to see. You're just going to be a vessel. And 
they, one vessel looks just like the other vessel. Mm -hmm. One has the potential to be brighter, and this is was created to have a, a purpose to bring light, but it's not going to bring as much. But guess what? When they're both connected to the power, they both are in their element. <laughs> That's a good one. So, they both are in their purpose. I'm asking this question today, are you fulfilling your purpose in God by being the light to the darkness? Reflecting Jesus. Bring the next thing up, Grant, please. We're called to be salt and light in this world. We reflect Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. I think this is the last turning place today, so... Matthew chapter 5. Let's start at verse 13. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, it cannot be made salty again. Salt is useless if it loses its salty taste. It'll be thrown out where people will just walk all over. You are the light that shines for the world to see. You are a city built on a hill that cannot be hidden. People don't hide a lamp under a bowl. They put it on a lampstand. Then the light shines for everyone in the house in the same way. Say it in the same way. Same. Say it again. In the same way. You should be a light for other people. Live so they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Live so they will see the good things that you do and praise your Father in heaven. One of the things Jesus is saying here is when you live and you do good things in his name, people see it. It brings light. You're a light that shines. One of the things light does is expel darkness. Good works, other translations say good actions, is one of the ways we be a light and bring that light to darkness. Can people look at us, look at you and look at me, and tell who we belong to? Not by what we say, because everybody's got a good word, but by what we do and how we act. If yes, then it glorifies God, and the Father will bring them to the Father. And if no, Jesus said it's hidden under a bushel basket. And ask yourself today, am I a dim or burned out Christian? Can people even tell if I'm a Christian? Grant, bring the next scripture up. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing so you'll be blameless and pure, children of God without any fault. But you are living with evil people all around you who have lost their sense of what is right. Among those people, you shine like lights in a dark world and you offer them the teaching that gives life. You know, a lot of people have been taught to, for as Christians, we've been taught in churches all our life, to run from the darkness, to run from it, have nothing to do with the dark world, separate yourself so much from it. How are we ever supposed to lead anybody to the Lord? How are we ever supposed to bring light to a place? We're not supposed to have the world inside of us and do what they do. But Jesus sent his disciples out to the darkest places on earth, and they brought light. Paul, I read to you when he was in Athens and when he was in Rome, what he did on Mars Hill, that sermon he did, when he was around all the people worshiping, you know they had little gold statues and little rock statues and stone statues, and they would worship them, and they would give money to them, and they would pray to them, and they would, and he saw all this stuff going around here, and it was dark, there was no Jesus there at all, but he carried the Holy Spirit, and although people laughed at him and mocked at him, he didn't walk out without walking out with a couple people that believed. And it got so much 
It spread like fire. So, because he had fire. If you have fire, you, if somebody gets close to you, they'll start burning. And among those people, you shine like lights in a dark world because you offer them. You don't force it to them, but you offer them the teaching that gives life. Then Jesus said, salt has certain attributes. Grant, bring it up, please. Here's the attributes of salt. He calls us salt and light. How many people um, love those days where it's all gray and cold outside? Uh, to me, I was up in Schenectady, New York, three days a week for six months. I don't believe I ever saw the sunshine. It was gray, and it was cool, and it was nasty, and I... I long to see that ball of fire in the sky because that light just brings warmth and everything to you. And we're that. We're called to be that. And Jesus said we're also called to be salt, like salt. One of the things salt does is make you thirsty. That means people want what you have. That's the real... And I believe this. And the Lord, when I was praying about this, the Lord said, you know, that's the real purpose of the prosperity message and the real purpose of the healing message that's preached. Not to show how great we are, how to show that how God has touched us in our life. It's to bring people, make them want what you have. And you got it by believing the word of God and trusting God. I mean, when I found out these things, when I found out that God didn't want me poor and he didn't want me sick, I was poor and sick all the time. And then when I found out, and it was through some teaching, but when I found out reading in the word that that was the will of God for my life, that he wanted to be my provider, and I needed one. And he wanted to be my healer, and I needed one of them too. I was sick all the time, and I was broke most of the time. And when I found this out, I looked at his word and I saw what his word said about it and I did it and it changed me and it changed my circumstance and it changed my life. And it wasn't so I could say, look at me, I'm a great man of faith. See how it's working at me? For me, it was so God could be glorified and it would make people thirsty for it. When you give your testimony, it's not a brag. It's a, if it's a brag on anything, it's a brag on God. Look what God did. Look what God did. I don't know a lot of you before God, but I know some of you before God, and I can say, look at your life and say, look what God did. Look what God did for you. Look, where were you before the Lord? Now look at you. Now don't get comfortable because look where, you don't even know where you're going to be. You know why? Because you're, you're salty. Hallelujah. Number two, go ahead, Graham. It adds flavor. Yeah. Who in here puts salt on their food? Yes, sir. Some people put too much. When you put salt on your food, it means live lives that enhance and are beneficial to other people. Don't be so busy helping yourself, you ignore other people, saved or some unsaved. What are some of the things you do with the idea of blessing other people? I'll ask that question again. That's good. What are some of the things you do with the idea of blessing other people in mind? And I'm not talking about just your family. Jesus said even unbelievers do that. I'm talking about things that you do that add flavor to somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. If you have a hard time thinking of anything and nothing's coming up, you need a little bit more salt, okay? You be, need to be a little bit more salty so you can give it out. Shouldn't have a blank look. Number three, salt preserves. Do you know if you didn't, if you didn't have preserve? What did preservatives do when you put it in something? It, it keeps it fresh. What if you didn't preserve it? What if you had some meat hanging and you didn't preserve it and you ate it? What would happen? It would poison you. Salt preserves. Keeps it preserved. Next thing, Grant. It changes the environment it touches. If we're supposed to be salt, if we walked outside today, like I did this morning, I walked out on my front steps, they're wooden, 
and it was wet, and there was a sheet of ice across every step this morning. And I found out the hard way, unfortunately. I slipped a little bit and fall. I slipped, and I said, whoa. I didn't even notice it. I didn't expect it. But if there was ice outside, an inch thick, and I was to put salt on it, what would happen? It would change that environment, wouldn't it? Do you know whatever environment you go into, if you're salty for the Lord, you'll change it. It does. Mm -hmm. Next one, Grant. It acts as an electric light in your bodies. Your body needs electric lights, or you wouldn't have any energy for your heart, right? Uh, it acts as an electric light in your body. All I know is uh, hospitals and doctor's offices, when you're sick, they hook you up. First thing they do for any reason is what? Hydrate. You put saline, saline solution in you. Yeah. IV, right? For just about anything. Why? Because the salt in there strengthens the electrolytes in your body. I'm not a nurse or a doctor, but I did sleep at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> Last thing. It promotes healing. Whoever had a cut and went into the ocean with it? Anybody ever? What happens? It stings right away, doesn't it? But if you notice, it speeds up the healing process. And that's us. We're going to bring the next one up. I'm going to try to wrap up. First thing, we're not the world's judges, but we are supposed to have standards. We're supposed to make a biblical stand. This is how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to be salt and light in the world according to Jesus. And the third thing I want to say today is we're supposed to be an on-purpose person and God's growth formula. This is um, how people were one to the Lord and how the early church grew. And God spoke to me during the time of fasting we had a few weeks ago and uh, gave me this direction we're supposed to go in. And uh, Grant, bring the next slide up, please. And one of the things, and I was looking at this, and I remembered, I read the vision statement we had 18 years ago when we started the church. This is what God told this church to do 18 years ago. And I had forgotten. I had forgotten. And he's supposed to, he says, this is the forefront, full plan and purpose for Family Worship Center. And the first thing is apostolic teaching, which only means discipleship. You know, we're not stuck, called to be church pew sitters. That's right. We're called to be disciples of Jesus. Disciples do what their master does. We have, certain times in this church, we have discipleship training opportunities in this church for you to learn. You'll learn, you'll get a little, you'll get a message on Sunday, but if you ever really wanted to learn how to pray and get the heart of God, we have prayer opportunities happening here. We have Wednesday nights. We have Sunday mornings. We have special services where we teach. We have services where all we do is worship on Wednesday nights sometimes. This is where you become a disciple. This is one of the training times that you become a disciple. We have fellowship times. And we kind of combine two and three together. Breaking bread together times. But you know that also means inviting people to your house to have a meal with you. That's where you connect with them. That's where hearts connect. That's where you get to learn and know people better when you eat with them. I mean, we've eaten with some of you, and we've had two and three and four hour lunches and dinners and stuff like that. And we're still there. I don't know what the waiter's thinking. I wish they would leave so I could get more of a tip. We make sure they get a healthy enough tip that they don't mad at us. But, but we have dinners where we connect. And that's needed. You look at the person, look at all around your church right here. Are you connected to everybody? If not, you should be. You should be. You're parts of the body of Christ. Are you connected with them? Breaking bread and fellowship together. There's people that don't stay for any fellowship things. They don't think they need it. Guess what? You do. You do. You don't grow. The church doesn't grow unless you do. And in times of prayer, that's, I got, I'm getting so, maybe I shouldn't say this, I'll check it out with the Lord. I'll say it. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Lord. Um, yes, I am sure. I would love it if everyone here came out on Wednesday night 
and pray together. That would be great. But I understand everybody can. And the ones that come and do, it's kind of different every week, maybe a little bit different every week. But we really, sometimes are really fantastic. And God shows up in miraculous, supernatural ways. And we really have a good time. And, and I mean, I've been doing it for 30 some years and I, I'm not tired of it. And uh, I mean, I also could have other things I could be doing on Wednesday night, okay? Just saying. And not every church pastor comes to prayer on Wednesday night. Lots of times there's prayer in a church, pastor doesn't go. But I enjoy it. And I've gotten to the top place where, where there's two or three. I don't want to say I don't care, but I don't care. Because wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is right in the midst. And our prayer times are just as good when there's only two or three people or four people or five people as there is when there's been nine and ten people. They're just as good. And aren't they? And we leave out of here and we don't put a time limit on the Lord. We just leave out of here when we're done. And it's awesome. And um, I'd like to say this is where most people learn how to pray. When they go to a time of prayer, they learn how to pray the word. They learn how to pray the spirit. They learn how to pray something for you. And there comes a time in all of our lives that we're going to have to need to learn how to pray. Do you know those God is great, God is good, love and thank us for the food. You know, you might have prayed that way when you're five, but God doesn't expect you to have that kind of relationship when you're 30 or 40 or 50. Don't shout me down. So, God, I'm saying this. This is the last word for today. God wants you to be involved in this. He wants your involvement. Are you going to get involved in what God's saying? I, I look at our food times or, what, once a month mm -hmm. sometimes. I think we should have fellowship times in a month too, playing games or just having fun together, watching movies together or something, like somebody over your house, having a church, I don't care. But our fellowship times of food times once a month, I look at this. When you leave, you have to eat anyway. You're going to eat anyway. When you, when you leave, you're either going to have to cook it or you're going to have to buy it. But you're going to eat. So guess what? You have something prepared here for you by loving hands and good cooks. And there, and it usually is, I would say, better than you can get in a, in a restaurant someplace. And she even caters to the people that can't have certain things. She thinks of them. She's, Janine's very thoughtful when she puts things together. She thinks of, oh, you can't eat this? I'll have an alternative, something for you so you can eat. And this idea is not just to eat together. The idea of this is to get involved in what God is saying. Even if it's just hanging around talking for a few minutes. <laughs> Connect. Because if you're not connected to the body of Christ, you're out there where the devil can get you. And that's it. Do you feel like you learned anything today? Let me read, let me read something to you. We're done. 